Think about it, start us off on the right note tonight. I'm not getting very small from you ladies, so we better turn our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And after you have found 1 Timothy 3, would you please stand with me out of respect to God's word? 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And we will be reading the first six or seven verses. Paul says, beginning of verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Our Father, as we turn our attention to your word tonight, we ask you, Father, that you would grant to us clarity of mind, that we may understand your truth. I ask you, Father God, that you would grant to me clarity of speech, that I may give your truth clearly, lovingly, yet accurately. Father, this is not about us. This is not about me. Father, we are here because of you. And everything that we say and do tonight, Father God, is about you. And we ask, Father, that you would be honored and glorified. For it's in Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. There are many passages in the New Testament that are not liked by some evangelicals. If you are many and you don't like Romans 9 and John 6, if you are a women liver, you don't like 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. But these are all passages, folks, that we have to deal with. And uh, we have to, we believe all the scriptures inspired of God, which we affirm to sola scriptura. We believe all the scripture is the final authority. Then we have to accept all of the scripture. And what Paul is doing in this passage is that he is moving from the congregation to dealing with the elders of the leadership of the church. Let me start out by saying that the effectiveness and the testimony of the ministry is largely a reflection of its leaders, right? In fact, in the prophet Hosea says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 9, and there shall be like people like priests. You've all heard of the adage, monkey see, monkey do. And the, the elders of the church can't expect the people in the queue to rise above their own level. As Hosea said, like the priest or like the people, it will be like what the priest is. And the principle, again, is very clear that under normal circumstances, just like in your home, under normal circumstances, the people will not normally rise above its leaders. And so important is it that these leaders, both elders and deacons, behave themselves in a Christ-honoring way, that Paul gives a list of qualifications of these church leaders. Now, folks, let me say that it is an inseparable link between the character of the church and the quality of leadership that is in the church. 
Leaders must set a good example for the people of the church to follow. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 40, he said, a, a disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 16, he says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. And Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, he says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And so it's very important that not only that the congregation act right, and we begin to touch the hem of the garment on that, but it is also true that the leadership of the church act right. And as the congregation, as the church of Jesus Christ, as the congregation, the body of this local church, you must have an understanding of what the Bible requires of your leaders, whether it be the elders, whether it be the deacons, whether it be the trustees, you must understand what the qualifications are for your leaders. And there are some things that I want you folks to understand by way of introduction as we begin these things. I believe that it's important that we understand that in the New Testament, that nowhere in the New Testament does it teach a single elder rulership. Nowhere in the New Testament that there is one man that makes all the decisions for the church. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. Over in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, and we'll get there eventually, when speaking about elder compensation, it does not mention compensation just for one person, does it? Notice what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. He says, let the elders that will well be counted worthy of double honor. And notice with me, folks, that when Paul is speaking about the elders here, he is not talking about a single man. He is speaking about, in some cases, a group of elders, whether it be two, which is the case here, or whether it be 15, which is in the cases in much larger churches. And the word that Paul uses here is a plural noun. And so therefore, it must be interpreted accurately as a in a plural form. And so when Paul is speaking about the compensation of the elders in this context, he is speaking about the or respect in some, in some ways as well. He is speaking about the respect and the compensation of elders, plural. Because there is no indication in the New Testament of a single eldership rule. And let me give you another example over in the book of Acts. You remember in the book of Acts chapter 6 when a complaint rose about how some of the Jews were feeling that some of the widows were being neglected in the, in the daily serving of food. When the complaint came, just one man did not make the decision, did they? Notice what the text says in Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse number 2. Then the what? Then the senior pastor. Then the lead pastor, which, by the way, are not biblical terms. They are terms that we have put on these guys. What does it say? It says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who you may appoint over this business. But we... Singular or plural? Are y'all sure about the plural. Name? plural? But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the idea was, is that when something needed to be corrected or done in the church, it wasn't one elder or one person making the decision. It was a group, a body of elders filled with the spirit because in the New Testament, it knows nothing about a single eldership rule. It is a group of men, group of spirit-filled men that meet the qualifications of Scripture that handle these situations. And the call to be an elder in the church is an important call. And it is a call that must be taken seriously. 
not the one that must be taken seriously and also one that must be taken seriously by the congregation who is calling those men into the ministry. Now, but listen, folks, the Lord, and praise God for this, the Lord does not ask for sinful, for sinless perfection on the part of the elders. For all elders make sometimes grave mistakes. The New Testament also recognizes the fact that elders, in, in some cases, are the targets of gospel, of gossip, and scandal that has absolutely no source in the truth. And over my 27 years in the ministry, one of the things that I've noticed and witnessed in many ministries, not in any one particular, but in many ministries, is that there are many quote-unquote Christians that are very too quick to hear and to heed the vicious gossip that many people spout off about the elders of the church. And usually that is an attempt to justify their unfaithfulness or their lack of spirituality. I would imagine that many elders, myself included, have been the victim of quote-unquote Sunday afternoon roast or coffee time gossip about the preachers. And when that happens in the home, then the mom and dad wonder why the kids don't respect them as mom and dad, don't respect the elders, and don't respect the church. And more importantly, don't respect the Lord. Because when you disrespect the office that the Lord has created, you disrespect the Lord Jesus Christ. And I bring all that up because as we look at these qualifications together over the next few weeks, there's probably not an elder that stands in the pulpit that would not have disqualified himself if the church members listened to vicious gossip. This is why the New Testament says, that's why Paul says over in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy and chapter verse 19, he says, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. The Holy Spirit of God recognized the fact that the elders were going to be victims of slander by those attempting to justify himself. So he, through Paul, said, unless it comes with at least two or three witnesses, people that actually saw it, that can verify the accuracy of what is being said, do not even give an audience. Because God's intention is to protect the office of the elders. And so if somebody comes to you and tries to tell you gossip about me or gossip about uh, my father, and, that, and there's not two or three witnesses that can verify, I witness that they, have, that, they have saw, that they saw this, what does the Bible say do? You don't even give it an audience. Sure. Well, you can say that I can't. Let's we'll say it a little louder. Just as the elders are to serve the church, listen to me, folks. The church is to protect the reputation of the elders. You say, well, what about if we have a, what about if we have a bad elder? Well, the Lord will bring that out in due time. You don't need to listen to vicious gossip about it. I have been the victim of this. I'm sure every elder has. Of people spouting off lies about me with absolutely no verification that it was true. But the sad reality about that is, is I've not only been the victim of that gossip, but I've been the victim of church members believing the gossip. And I've been the victim of church members leaving the church because they believe the gospel of one person. The Bible is clear. My job is to teach you the word. Your job is to protect me. And when we love one another, there's no problem. There's no problem. 
Now here are qualifications of the elders. In both public and private life that the Lord gives for elders that serve in that capacity. And what I'm going to do is we're going to break these verses down for you. We're going to take our time. Y'all know me. We're going to, I'm in no hurry. I got other things to preach on, but I'm in no hurry. I want us to get this right. So I'm going to, we want to break these down. And, and, and to what exactly what Paul is saying. Because everything I've said so far makes sense. Yes. And I want to break this down to what, what is the calling that God puts on an elder's life? First of all, it is a precise calling. It is a precise calling. Look at verse number one. This is a true saying. If a man, stop right there. Oh boy. This kind of continues for those of you who set out. This kind of continues. I don't take that personal. I, I don't think you missed chapter 2 on purpose, ladies. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This kind of continues, though, the instruction. I think the only one that missed was Liv. Anyway, this kind, of <laughs> this kind of continues the instruction from chapter 2. And your husband said, yes, because of what you're preaching. That's why. <laughs> okay. No, he didn't. He didn't. And this is the fact that leadership in the church is not for everyone. If ever, my father told my mother when he was fighting the Lord on preaching, he said, Kathy, not everybody can be a preacher or there'd be nobody to listen. Well, that's a cop out, isn't it? But the fact is, the ministry is not for everyone. And the Apostle Paul here makes it clear and unquestioning instruction here that the church leaders are to be what? Yeah. Men. I only had one woman that said that. Are to be men. The Bible says this is a true saying. This is the word of the living God, right, folks? This is a true saying. If a man, if a man. Now, just for clarity, the sake of clarity and giving you all the full information, uh, in case y'all go back to your Greek New Testament, Brother Fletch, and check me out, which he probably will. I get emails all week from Brother Fletch, you know, which is fine. I, I like that. I like that. The word that, that appears there is a Greek word, tis, and it's an indefinite pronoun. And it is translated in most English translations or all English translations as any man. So you ask the question, if the literal reading says this, if any, that more would like this, if any, desire the office of a bishop, then why is it translated any man? The answer to that, folks, is threefold. First of all, it would be, it would be grammatically correct, and the other two is con contextual. Grammatically, it is correct because it is translated, as the indefinite pronoun tis is translated that way because it is a masculine pronoun. Therefore, it would be correct to say that the indefinite pronoun, masculine pronoun, sh should be translated, if any man. Contextually, it is translated that way because of verse 2, a man, a woman, can hardly be a one-woman man. Right? I mean, one of the quote, I mean, you don't know these days, but let's, let's go back into Paul's day when I was unheard of, pretty much even though they dress that way. But biblically speaking, scripturally speaking, spiritually speaking, it would be unheard of for a woman to think that they could occupy a position of leadership in the church where the author of the scriptures say that one of the qualifications is that that elder has to be a one-woman man. And we'll, we'll get to there. We'll have fun with that one. And also, when you get, you get down to verses 5 and 6, in Paul's day, women were not the head of the household. But Paul says that the elder has to rule his house well. So both grammatically and text, contextually, folks, it is pretty clear that the translation as we see it is correct. If any man. And Paul here reaffirms the fact of what he gave us back in chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, that women were not to be leaders in the church. Now, we emphasize to you, 
I hope very clearly last time together, two weeks ago together, that women in the church have a very, very important role in the church and in the home and in society. That's That goes without saying. My mother played a very vital role in the spiritual health that I experienced growing up and still does. My wife plays and plays a very vital role in the spiritual well-being of our children. And so it goes without saying that women in the church, the home, and society, men, we would not be what we are without them. Amen. Right? Amen. In fact, I would go so far to say that without women, you wouldn't be. What? Well, four years of college and seminary to figure that out. But that role, even though women have a vital role in the whole society and the church, that role does not include the leadership over God's people. Now, again, for the sake of clarity, I want to say again what the Bible is clear about. First, the creative narrative in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 views men and women as equally created in the image of God, correct? Therefore, we have, as men and women, we have equal value to God and should, and should be seen as having absolute equal value as persons in the church. Both men and women are recipients who are saved, are recipients of the same saving grace. Both men and women who are saved are recipients of the same Holy Spirit. Both men and women are recipients of many of the same spiritual gifts. I know some women that can administrate circles around some men, right? That's just facts. And we must admit that in the history of the church, that in large measure the evangelical church has failed to see the importance of women and their role in the church. And it is probably, I believe, a devaluation of women that has led women like Beth Moore and Joyce Myers and Paula White and those women to try to raise themselves up to a precipice of leadership. But we must follow the scriptural principle, folks, that have been laid out in scripture. And the scripture is very clear that even though a woman's role in the home, church, and society is very important, the scripture is clear that a woman is not to lead. Paul says, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 12 again, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer or I allow not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. It is the spe specific functions of teaching and guiding that are unique to men that Paul prohibits women from doing. Now, the objection to this that has been given for this position is that this specific situation that Paul is addressing was unique. Paul was probably addressing where women were teaching heretical doctrine. And, and Paul came into Ephesus and said, well, if you women are going to teach heretical doctrine, then you just need to be quiet and not teach at all. Well, that argument is not persuasive. Since there is no clear statement in 1 Timothy that says anything about women actually teaching anything, truth or false. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3 talks about women who are gossiping, but doesn't mention false doctrine. Moreover, Paul does not simply tell certain women who are teaching false doctrine to be silent. But what does Paul say? Paul says, I, per I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over the man. And finally, he, the, one of the reason Paul gives for this prohibition is not the one proposed in this objection, but a far different one. The situation with Adam and Eve before the fall and before there was any sin in the world. By the way, that's not a, that's, the fall didn't, wasn't a reversal of the roles, was it? 
The reason Paul says that the men are to lead and the women are not to lead is why? He makes it very clear in verse 13 and 14 of 2 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 2, and that is the fall, right? The man was created and then the woman, and man was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, being in the transgression. So the objection has been given. Well, you know, guys, women were women. That was a, that was a special situation. Women can preach now because that was talking about false doctrine. Well, well, Paul says, no, I'm not. I'm not telling you this because women have been teaching false doctrine. I'm telling you this because women don't need to teach men at all. They don't need to teach. Period. They don't need to usurp authority over man at all. Another objection that has been given for this position is that, well, that's not that's a specific situation because women weren't well, were not well educated back then. And therefore, because they were not well educated, they were not qualified to teach or have any governing roles in the church. Well, I can think of no I can think of no more less educated people than the uh, original apostles. I mean, you got a bunch of fishermen. How educated were they? Nowhere in the scripture does Paul say that it is a lack of education that is the reason why women can't teach. But he says women are not to teach or have authority over the man. And then, again, he points back to creation. Now, look what Paul says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Did the apostles have formal education? Did they have seminary training? In fact, the Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Paul and Peter were seen as ignorant men, but they marveled at the, at the wisdom that the Spirit of God gave them. Paul and Peter were not educated men. So the fact that somebody come along and say, well, women can't preach because, well, Paul was talking about women that were uneducated. Well, they were all uneducated. They were all unlearned. The church recognized that. So that's not the reason. What's the reason? God said a woman cannot usurp authority over a man or teach a man. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I don't think I need to beat that dead horse anymore, but I'm going to. <laughs> in, in Acts chapter 18, verse 26, and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogues. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, the, there were many well-educated women. But that was not the reason Paul gave for not being able to teach. And in fact, the home church of Priscilla and Aquila was the church at Ephesus. Now, do you think Paul would come along and write to the church at Ephesus where Priscilla and Aquila would have been sitting in the pew and said that a woman can't teach or usurp authority over a man because she's uneducated? When you got Priscilla and Aquila there that were more educated than some of the men? The Bible says there in Acts 18? No. It has nothing to do with education. I'm just giving you folks some objections you've probably never heard, but I can tell you if you get into it with people, you'll hear it. Because I've heard them. And this is why they don't hold water. It has nothing to do with education. It has to do with what God established as the roles of a man and a woman. Paul said if a man, this is a true saying, if a man, if a man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? That's kind of Paul's way of saying, you got a problem with that? Take that up with God. You take that up with God. 
it's it's probably a good thing that, that if a lady in the church has a question about what's being said in the pulpit, she go home and ask her husband. That's what that's scriptural. That it, some women don't like it, but that's clearly what the Bible says. Now, the immediate context of that passage is in evaluating or judging of prophecies in the congregation. When a man of God speaks the word of God, what was going on here is that women were approaching the man and said, I don't agree with that. I think you're wrong. Earlier in my ministry, I, this is funny, but earlier in my ministry, I've said some things from the pulpit, and I've had women shout out from the congregation, I don't agree with that. And I don't remember what I said. I'm sure it was gracious. I'm sure it was gracious. At least I hope it was. But this is the context of what Paul's talking about. A woman going up to the elders and saying, well, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Paul says, you be quiet. That's not your place. If you have a question about what's being said from the pulpit, you go home and you ask your husband, and then your husband or you and your husband can come to the elders, and then you can ask them the question. But it is not, according to the scriptures, it is not the place of the women to approach the elders and try to discern or question what is being said. Now listen, folks, it's not a matter of pride. At least it shouldn't be. It's a matter of this is the clear teaching of what the Bible says. What did Paul clearly say back in that verse? That if a woman has a problem, do what? That latter part of the verse, let them ask who? Who? Their husbands where? At home. At home. The scriptures do not give place for women to critique or speak up of what's being said from the pulpit. And I don't care if it's a if it's a vacation Bible school or if it's church service. In the church, women are not allowed to speak up and critique what is being said by the elders. If you have any questions about what's being said, go home, ask your husband. And then he or both of you come and ask your question to the elders. So, in the, so when the scriptures speak about the calling of the elders or the, or the leadership of the elders, first of all, keep in mind that the rule or the eldership is a multiple person rule. It is not a single man rule. Nowhere in the New Testament, again, do you see a one single person Ruling the church, making decisions for the church. It was a boy, it was a group of elders making the decisions for the church. So it is a precise calling. It is a calling that is for men. All right. Any any questions about that? You you ladies are afraid to ask it now. Number two, it is, it is a passionate calling. It is a precise calling. It is a passion. Oh, no, I'm not afraid to ask a pastor. You just said that I could. It is a precise calling, and it is a it is a passionate calling. Look down at verse uh, one again. Paul says, "This is a true saying: If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work." When my son James thought that he began to feel the call of God on his life to the gospel ministry. He asked me this question. He said, Dad, how do I know that I'm called into the ministry? Or he may have even asked me, Dad, how did you know that you were called into the ministry? And, and I, I have been asked that question too many times to think of, of just people asking or people thinking that maybe they're called and want to know, you know things to look for. And my answer is always the same. My answer is always the same. It's the same answer I give James, gave James, the same answer I give everybody. How do I know that I'm being called into the ministry? I say this, it always begins with a desire. It always begins with a desire. Folks, listen, have you ever heard somebody say, well, I would follow the Lord, but I'm afraid what he's asked me to do? Have you ever heard anybody say that? I, mean, I have, but let me tell you this. God will never call someone into a particular job in the ministry without first giving that person the desire to do it. Let me say that again. God will never 
call you into a particular job in the ministry without first giving you a desire to do it. And I think that it is very clear what Paul says here. Notice what Paul says. Paul did not say, if a man feels led. Well, I feel led to be in the gospel ministry. Well, you can be led to fall in a ditch, too. Okay? Amen. Uh, you know, it's, it, it doesn't have to do, well, I feel led. Well, what does that mean? Uh, does God have you by a choke cable and tug you? I feel led. What does that mean? Notice Paul also did say, well, I feel the necessity. Uh, what about if your feelings change and your necessity changes? Are you going to bail on the ministry? What does Paul say? Paul says, no, if the man, what? Desires. Desires. That's a lot stronger, folks, than being led. That's a lot stronger than feeling necessity or feeling compulsion. Paul says, if any man desires... And the word desire, or ego, it literally means in classical Greek, it meant to stretch oneself out or to stretch forth your hand. There's a second Greek word there. If a man, or ego, if a man stretches out to the office of a bishop, he, epithumeo, he sets his heart upon a good work. Paul says if a man makes a conscious effort to stretch out or to set his heart on a certain job. He longs for or he has an earnest desire for something that is good. And when you put those two terms together, or ego, the first desire, and epithumeo, the second desire, these two terms describe the man who outwardly pursues the ministry because he has a driving desire in his heart. And I believe, folks, that this, for the elder, this goes beyond the desire to get up in front of someone and preach. Anybody can do that. And I know a lot of men that stand in pulpits they have no more business standing in the pulpit than I have sitting in the Oval Office. Because anybody can get in the pulpit and preach something and start speaking. H.B. Charles says this, quote, if someone wants to preach without study, then all they want to do is act. End quote. Part of the inward driving desire to do the work of the ministry is to calculate a life that matches the requirements that Paul gives here. Now, admittedly, some men speak, seek spiritual oversight in the church because people they respect have encouraged them to do so. I remember when I went away to Bible college my first year, I, I majored in evangelism. Well, that's kind of odd because I hate to travel. I went to a Bible college where they had a major of evangelist. And I hate to travel. I hardly like to travel from home to here, much less cross country. <laughs> but I majored in that because I was, I was encouraged by people I respect to say, well, that seems to be your niche. Well, I did it for a year and then began to work in this local church and found out, listen, that's not my niche at all. My niche is to watch people grow. My niche is to give the same people every week the Word of God and watch them get it. You can't do that if you're there once a year. My desire that God has given me is to stand up here in this pulpit and look at you folks and see the spotlight go on and say, I got it, and then watch you grow thereby. But some people have that driving desire or that, or that desire for spiritual oversight because somebody they respect told us what they needed to do. Others pursue it because they think that's the best option for them. They love the Lord. They love the church. So they go to Bible college. They go to seminary. And they prepare for service. But because they are driven by, not driven by an internal passion for the ministry, it becomes more academic to them than anything else. On the other hand, some have a great passion for the ministry, but they lack self-control, 
and devotions to the priorities of preparation. Listen, folks, preaching is easy. Uh, if you were to ask me in private, I would tell you, my father would tell you the same thing. Preaching is easy. I mean, after you've been doing it for 27 years, preaching is easy. You see me at my best right now. That may not be much, but this is my best right now. Like it or lump it, this is my best right now. Because this is easy. It's getting prepared to get here. Is That's the hard work. Both the study and the time it takes to study and the preparation of the heart. And then it's very difficult. And I've had to do it. He's had to do it. It's very difficult to get in the pulpit and preach when you look out in the congregation and somebody out there has broken your heart. And that's happened to every elder. That's when it gets hard. That's when the proof of whether or not that man is truly has the burning desire in his heart to do it. When it stops being fun. When it stops being easy. But there are a lot of, a lot of men out there who are in the ministry, but they lack the discipline enough to get on track to achieve that desire. Listen, folks, it's tough to sit down and spend 15, 20 hours a week studying, studying a passage to preach. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes. And yeah, admittedly, computers and everything makes it a lot easier than it used to. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes. The man that is truly called to the ministry is marked by both an internal consuming passion and an outward pursuit of what he inwardly desires. For him, the ministry is not the best option. The ministry for him is the only option. There's nothing else he could do with his life and be fulfilled. In fact, it was Charles Spurgeon, James, that told his preachers in training, quote, if you can do anything else but the ministry and have fulfillment and joy, then do it. You are not called, end quote. Because folks, for a man that says I'm called to be an elder, that's a burning desire that has outward manifestations of that. Simply put, folks, let me put it to you this way. Ambition for office corrupts. Desire for office purifies. Let me give that to you again. Ambition for office corrupts. Desire for office purifies. In Mark chapter 10, Beginning in verse 42, Jesus said, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to be great, become great among you, shall be your servants, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. The elders rule the church, but they're, but they're not to lord it over the congregation. I told you, I've told you this before, that, that my authority reaches no farther than this desk. I don't reach into your home to tell you, men, what your wives can do, men, what you can do. That's not my place. Because even though the elders rule the church. We don't lord it over them. But we shouldn't lord it over them. You know the best, you know the most dedicated and most faithful servant is the devil. He is relentless in his pursuit of unrighteousness. The man of God needs to be equally as relentless in his pursuit of the truth and give it to the congregation. 
I can get in the flesh. When I sit in a congregation where I have somebody tell me that somebody got in the pulpit and basically granted them the Reader's Digest, who did not give them the Word of God. Folks, this Word is so rich. How can a man get in the pulpit and treat it flippantly? How, this is serious business. And how can a man get in the pulpit and treat the battle flippantly? And when the man that stands in the pulpit treats the Word of God flippantly, he treats the battle flippantly, and he treats his people flippantly, and has no business being in the pulpit. Some men are in the pulpit just because they were there. We need a, we need a pastor. I see you raise hands. You're a man. I've heard of churches that call pastors that way. Shame. The church must be led by men with a passion. Can you imagine how passionate, how passionate would you folks be about the Word of God if the elders of your church were not passionate about the Word of God? Because this is where it starts. And a man that is truly called, the Bible says, has a burning desire in his heart, and he does everything that he can to perfect that. Yeah, I watch myself preach. I do. I, I, I'm the, probably the most frequent visitor to my own YouTube site. I'm my biggest critic too, but I don't let my wife watch. But I think, seriously, I am probably the the most faithful visitor, other than the man that uploads the videos for me, I'm probably the most faithful visitor to my site. I like my own site. But I can honestly tell you, folks, by what God is my witness, is not for pride's sake. I watch myself. Because the burning desire that God has given me in the heart causes me to stretch out and be better, not only for his glory, but for your benefit. And the only way I can get better is to watch myself make mistakes. Well, I really shouldn't have said that. Well, I should have said that. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> the only way I can do this, folks, is to watch. I watch a lot of preaching, period. And James drives his mother crazy with all the preaching he watches on YouTube. And it's not me. That drives me crazy. I don't get that. Watches this crackpot Paul Washer and those, those, those guys. But he don't watch me. Well, he gets to see me live, I guess he'd say. But we watch a lot of preaching because that's, that's for us. Part of the desire in our heart that causes us, remember the, the classical meaning was to reach out, of desire was to reach out. That's part for us, is part of reaching out to make ourselves better. So we make, I watch other preachers' hand gestures. I, I listen to the way they phrase things. I, I listen to how they walk around or don't walk around the pulpit. You know, I watch some preachers that kick their legs up. I, I don't do that because I might embarrass myself. So I stay away from that. But I watch myself and I compare my mannerism with other preachers so that I can get better. I've been doing this for 27 years, but I need to get better. And I watch people that have been doing it for 50 years. Because that's for me. That's part of reaching out. The desire God gave me in the heart, that's part of reaching out to make myself a better elder. And so the the leadership of the church it is a precise calling. If any man, it is a passionate calling. If any man desires the office of the bishop, he desires a good work. Number three, it is a particular calling. Not everybody meets qualifications. Not everybody meets qualifications. And we'll look at that next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this time we've had in your word. And I pray and trust, Father, that it has been beneficial to your people. I pray that they have learned the word clearly. I pray 
Father, that I have been clear with your truth. Father God, I pray that we will leave tonight saying that it has been good to have been in the house of the Lord. And Father, continually to give the elders of this church the passion for the ministry that drives not only us, but will drive your people. I pray in Christ's name.